In this conversation, I'm honored to speak with Robert Beiser from Polaris about the issues surrounding human trafficking. Polaris works to shape the systems that make sex and labor trafficking possible and profitable in North America. Robert himself has worked in anti-trafficking advocacy for over 11 years and helped dramatically increase the number of sex trafficking survivors connecting with support services in Washington state and across the US. Robert and I talk about how behavioral science can help us solve society's most pressing and insidious challenges. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for joining me in this opportunity to have a conversation with you about behavioral science and about the incredible work that you do at Polaris. Happy to be here. Wonderful. I'd like to start with uh, just helping us to understand the work that you do. Um, what is it that Polaris does? What is sure. it you guys are focusing on? So Polaris is a leading organization in the United States working on the issues of labor and sex trafficking. Um, we work both to respond on behalf of survivors to situations of exploitation and also uh, work on the systems and structures that allow people who are vulnerable to be exploited in the first place. So my work as the director of the Strategic Initiative on Sex Trafficking is on that upstream systems change and prevention side. So Polaris operates the United States National Human Trafficking Hotline, where we have a network of support services that are available for us to refer to in all 50 states. Um, we also have law enforcement uh, contacts uh, that we can refer situations of trafficking to, to provide greater safety and support to people who might be in a trafficking situation or needing to get out of a trafficking situation. Um, and we work with international partners to help support similar systems being set up in countries like Canada and Mexico and around the world. So we serve at this place where um, data around trafficking arrives, where support getting out of trafficking situations arrives and a place that's really striving to learn how we can look at the root causes of trafficking so that we can stop the harm before it starts. What an incredibly important mandate. So it's uh, absolutely incredible to learn about the organization and spend more time today talking about the work. Sure. But first I'd love to hear more about your journey. How did you go from a career in technology at Microsoft to this work? So there's nothing linear about that that I can really uh, explain. Um, I was um, working in the technology space out of college, um, ran a web design company, started doing the very exciting job at Microsoft of a systems analyst and an operations analyst, um, basically looking at the, the things that were going on inside the company and um, the team that I worked with tried to make the best practices, the training that people were doing, the recruiting that led to the most success available to all the different pieces of the, the technical side of Microsoft. At the same time, I found that I was volunteering a lot and that while the work at Microsoft was like the most exciting social crossword puzzle that I could ever do, um, I always had this feeling that I wanted to be connected to change in the community and at some point, I ended up volunteering 25, 30, 35 hours a week, in addition to my 60 plus hour week job at Microsoft. And it really sent a strong message to me that I was just drawn to create change in a different way. Now, uh, interestingly, it's almost 20 years later, there's a whole uh, technology for nonprofits and um, what is what is it called? Uh, the Technology for Social Impact Initiative at Microsoft that could have been my job um, and I would have been able to help it in a similar way, but it, it wasn't around so much when I was there. So 
I left the tech world and my first stop um, was the most dramatic one where I moved to the Middle East and was learning Arabic and Hebrew, working on conflict transformation in Israel, Lebanon and Jordan. And um, unfortunately a war broke out uh, right in the area that I was in between um, Israel and Lebanon. And so my um, service work and my learning uh, were a bit disrupted. Um, it's hard to downplay for folks in the States when rockets are hitting the place where you're supposed to go to school, that everything's really safe and okay. Uh, and so uh, family back in the States said, you're not allowed to be um, in the Middle East anymore. We want you to come back. And when I did, um, I really had this uh, challenge trying to connect with different service organizations as a young professional. At that time, I was in my 20s. And there were a number of different organizations that I talked to about how that was a challenge that I experienced and how that was a challenge they were experiencing. And so I started doing work um, with college students and young adults, specifically finding ways to get them easily involved um, in different types of social change spaces, whether it was around um, immigrant rights and racial justice or education access um, or labor issues and really setting up relationships between nonprofits and businesses or schools so that it was just not much of a lift to get people involved in the ways that would really create impact and social change um, in the ways that the, the um, non-governmental organizations were working on. And one of those uh, partners was an organization um, in Seattle, Washington called Seattle Against Slavery that was working on labor trafficking and sex trafficking that was happening in Washington state. And in addition to connecting other people with their work, I started volunteering with them. And then I volunteered with them so much that they asked me if I wanted to do it as my job. Um, and uh, they made me the incredibly compelling offer of we have no money to pay you <laughs> and no one has ever done this job before. And we don't have any sort of structure that we can provide you other than the work is already going on with this community of volunteers, but you won't have a boss. And we really think that this is something the community wants to be doing and that we can help lots of people. And I had felt some of that impact when I was a volunteer. And so um, I started working there um, and uh, became the executive director and was the first unpaid part-time employee with a title. And by the time that um, I left in 2019, uh, there were 15 staff and Seattle Against Slavery was making impacts on uh, preventing labor trafficking and sex trafficking, not just in Washington state, but building tools um, and um, training that people were using all over the country. A bunch of that work was being applied internationally. Um, and we had really started with that value of grassroots community connection and serving um, with the lead of survivors who had experienced uh, the violence and harm, directing what the community should be doing. And that model ended up um, growing pretty broadly. Uh, and then in 2019, Polaris, uh, which you know ends up being sort of a, a key partner for everyone who's doing anti-trafficking work in the States, um, started a conversation with me and I ended up um, moving to, to Washington DC to start working on seeing if I could help in the reduction of sex trafficking across the country. Ah, what an incredible story. Um, yeah, lots of road trips in there. Yeah. Right? And flights. I, <laughs> but I think one of the things that really resonated with me was your call for social impact and the sacrifices that you made along the way to fulfill that personal purpose. And I think that we live in a time now where many of us uh, don't have to make the sacrifices that you made. Um, some of the you know, paths have been uh, set in place. Some of the trails have been blazed by, by people like you. Uh, who can help make a connection between, uh, you know, uh, employment and social impact. But I think that we're even in a bigger place now where 
uh, stakeholder capitalism is starting to demand a connection to organizational level purpose and how our companies starting to serve and support these mandates, if not uh, being held to account for their individual firm level ethics, but also how they are uh, potentially supporting these initiatives within and at the purpose level. Yeah, there's certainly, I think, been a pretty significant sea change over the past 20 years. I mean, I always want to acknowledge that I was coming from such a position of like stability and uh, advantage and, you know, that I had gotten an education, that I had some skills that I could fall back on. So it was a, um, a high wire act with a very solid net in case anything went wrong. Um, but there have been folks who have been working in the so social change space um, who, you know, th those compromises to make a difference in our community um, have been hard fought and people have had personal sacrifices for such a long time that I think in the evaluation of me working in a space that you know, obviously nonprofits aren't going to be as lucrative as working in tech. Um, and the you're not going to know necessarily how much money your organization is going to have next year, let alone sometimes next month, as we've seen with COVID and companies can be a bit more, uh, for-profit companies have been a bit more stable. But I definitely got that feeling that when I look back at the work that I've done and how I've spent my time, that I would feel good um, knowing that the way I spent my time helped and served people and that I might not feel um, as fulfilled, um, you know, when I got ready reti to retire on my deathbed, if I was like, oh, well, um, I bought several things that were nice or I took care of my family well, um, I think that I just had a connection to thinking more about what the accomplishment of my life would be that wouldn't be about status. And I think what I'm seeing a lot now with companies is the people within companies having more awareness of the ripple effects of what their companies are doing. And you know, part of that has to do with technology, which is a connection there as well, um, that the visibility into, oh, these are the real like painful impacts or on the flip side, these are the you know real victories in lifting people up and getting them in situations that they wouldn't be in otherwise because of things my company did, that's how I wanna feel. And so I always am reading those sort of um, employee satisfaction surveys and people feeling like if their company is serving a mission or if their company is delivering value to people who have challenges, that people wanna work for those companies and that's exciting to them. And the visibility now into who is doing what, really gives people a choice. And I, you know, I end up seeing a lot of people who are younger than me saying, well, you know, th these, these companies are, are not good guy type of actors in the space. I wouldn't want to work for them. I'd rather, you know, earn a little bit less to help a little bit more. So it's an exciting trend to see. And of course, there are lots of companies that <laughs> don't worry about that at all and still are doing lots of challenging things. And it's one of the reasons why my organization has to work on the things it works on. Yeah, that's right. So absolutely, I think a moment uh, should be had by all the listeners um, who are either um, uh, can can take a moment to celebrate the unsung heroes of, of the volunteers who are called to service and a moment to uh, celebrate uh, people who are inside of companies starting to rally or push their organizations for social impact and a moment for the leaders who have taken some bold steps with or without stakeholders support to align their organizations to the North Star that Polaris has shown so brightly. So I think it's uh, it's absolutely worth a, a moment of, of recognition to uh, people like you who have helped um, blaze that trail. So the other thing that I, I wanted to talk to you about was uh, your own journey to behavioral economics. And you have been developing 
uh, thought leadership and an understanding of the dynamics of the space. You've been working on the variety of, of, of tools and, and levers and laws and so on uh, around uh, this challenge. But what was it that brought you to behavioral economics? Can you talk about that journey? Sure. I think in large part, um, wanting to understand why people did bad things so that we could get them to stop doing bad things. And also why people did good things when they didn't necessarily have to, so we could get more people to do good things. That always sort of fascinated me. And it actually ties a bit to some of the work that I did that was dispassionate about good or bad within Microsoft, which is how do you get people to do the things that you want them to do or, or the way that you want to do them, which at Microsoft was, you know, writing better code with less bugs or, you know, shipping things on time. I think it was really eye-opening for me when I started reading some of the work around predictable irrationality, I think when I was in high school or college, to understand, oh, I think I act for one reason, but I actually am acting for another reason, like on a, on a personal level. And what that opened up for me to not feel like, oh, I'm like, I'm out of control and I can't figure out what I'm going to do, but oh, I just need to look to other cues. I need to not assume that I know the things that are going to direct me in the ways that uh, I want to be directed, but that I predictably could change my direction with other things. Now, I feel like the idea of, you know, like nudging behavior change is so prevalent that, um, you know, like everyone should have a little picture of, uh, is it Daniel Kahneman up on their desk, like everywhere in the country of like understanding, like, no, these are the ways that people evaluate risk and reward and cost and things like that. And all of these things are, are growth off of that. So for me, when I started thinking about like, okay, why does racism happen? Like not it's this bad thing and some people act it out or some structures have it, but like, what are the things fundamentally that are predictable about that system and why are they functioning in the way that are? Why does labor exploitation happen? Why do people in an in-group treat people like immigrants in the United States as, as a significant issue or indigenous people you know, in the United States and Canada and Mexico, why are those people treated differently? And it's not, I think, some of the simple answers around, well, there are people who are bad and they're openly bad and you just have to convince them that they're bad and then they won't do those things anymore, which a lot of the like proposed solutions around how to address those issues really boiled down to, but there, there's actually predictable structures around people's behavior that are much clearer if we, if one like examines the underlying um, sort of steps that are being taken and why. And then the solutions that you come up with are fundamentally different than thinking that someone's bad and they should stop doing bad things. Um, and instead you say, oh, well, I'm going to intervene in these key ways to address those underlying structures that I wasn't even looking at before that sometimes can seem wildly disconnected. And now all of a sudden I'm getting the results that I wanted to see because I'm I'm addressing the things that that lead in that chain of events to the negative or that lead in that chain of events to the positive, which actually directly connects back to the idea of corporate responsibility and, and why people would work for a place and what they want to get out of their work life and have their selves show up to the world in their work situation. Um, so I think I was always fascinated by that. Um, I probably, you know, when I was in university, ended up reading um, like the sort of pop versions of lots of examples of these things like the Heath Brothers and Malcolm Gladwell stuff that relied so heavily on behavioral economics and then getting learning about the actual studies and research behind all of those different things. Um, just started more and more. Um, oh, the the Freakonomics type uh, of stuff that pulled out of a bunch of research. 
And so then I started thinking anytime that I was making an assumption about, okay, I want to address this issue. So clearly I have to address it in this way, or clearly the community needs to address it in this way. Just taking a step back to be like, well, that might be like a not at all grounded guess. Um, and what we saw more and more was that the people who are using a behavioral economics approach and looking at a sort of what are the, the pieces inside the engine and how are they working, they were producing results that the people that were just sort of doing paint by numbers on, you know, do good, do bad, just couldn't make the, the change um, that other people could make. Um, I'll say, you know, for a specific, specific example within the um, US context, looking at the people who are in the civil rights movement and understanding what their motivations were at the time in the 50s and 60s in the United States um, and seeing that there was a calculation that relied on behavioral economics that really wasn't acknowledged in the way that it was presented historically. Because the way that it was presented broadly was people just said, this is a thing that's wrong. It, and we know it's fundamentally wrong and we're just gonna bring more people to understanding that it's wrong and then people will pass laws so that we're less racist um, in the United States. And the truth was that the people inside the movement said, no, 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 we need to make people more horrified by the execution of racist policy than they are scared about their fears of interacting with people of other races, that there were two competing fears. And the way to do that was we will present the fear of interacting with others as so benign by being so clearly like calm and full of love and engaging and on many levels religious, so connected to faith values. And we will show the people who oppose us as violent, as you know, threatening, as out of control. And then we will ask our country to make a choice between us as the like calm, loving, religious uh, together people or the people who you don't know what the levels are that those people will go to. And then the, when the country was able to compare those two things, it wasn't a choice between right and wrong. It was a choice between that seems scary and this seems safer. Why would I not pick the, the safer choice? Um, and that safety allowed people to pass policies where they said, what are the the negative consequences of this, very little seemingly to me and myself, what are the negative consequences of continuing with that policy, this out of control violence that um, was seen you know, through the 60s on TV over and over again. Um, and so you know, understanding that this as a new field and, un and unlocking some of the motivations inside people um, has really come to fruition over the past 30 years, but some of the same tactics and understanding of, of what people's emotions were that aren't the things that they think um, or that they think they think um, have been enacted by social change uh, advocates for a long time. Robert, this might be a good time for us to talk about the project that our teams have been engaged on together. Um, would you be able to share uh, some of this work? I know that um, I know that some of our work has to remain uh, confidential, and um, you know I, I regret that we we can't share it. But I'm I'm hoping that people will understand that there are certain parts of the project that we can talk about, and there are just certain things that we will not be in a position to, to disclose. Um, so, so with that uh, permission and acceptance and tolerance from our audience uh, and, and the caveats that, that we needed to put on the table, um, I'd love for you to talk about what we are able to, to share for the benefit of others, if, if not just the hope of seeing how behavioral economics can be applied to some of uh, societies. Um, most uh, difficult, uh, most ugly uh, problems that we have, and perhaps they can learn from it or find a way to support and extend this effort. Sure, yeah. And I'll say for, for folks who want to learn about these connections, um, it is a um, not no or never, but 
just folks are, are will have to wait a bit because of the data collection that we're doing and the way that it, um, the work is going to be presented for its impact publicly. Um, but we're not going to um, let the the horse out of the barn quite yet on that. But I think I can speak broadly on the the way that the examination um, brings some of these insights to light. So fundamentally, when most folks think about the issue of human trafficking, um, for many people, their first thought is around international uh, smuggling of people for the purpose of compel compelled work or compelled uh, prostitution. And that might be because a victim is threatened, that might be physical violence where a person is actually, you know, like physically harmed over and over again to get them to perform work or, or be in prostitution or commercial sex. Or it might be that the person is tricked and then they're trapped in a situation where they might be in a country that they don't know, um, where they don't know the language, or they just don't have a way to navigate out of the situation because maybe they've taken on debt or something like that. So in the uh, trafficking legal space, we call those um, force, fraud, and coercion. So one of those three things. But for most folks, they think about it internationally and many times happening, um, you know, in developing countries, but maybe not in developed or industrialized countries. And I work solely on trafficking that happens in the United States. And I work solely on sex trafficking. And here, what we see is that the vast majority of sex trafficking that happens is with people born and raised in the United States. Certainly there are some people who come from other countries and end up being exploited. There are some people who are brought from other countries to the United States specifically with the purpose of being exploited. But the vast majority of what we see, um, both people needing help and the people who end up being um, engaged uh, in criminal investigations are people who are experiencing systemic disadvantages that makes them vulnerable for being targeted by traffickers. So, the behavioral science piece around that is understanding that this is a system that has somewhat predictable characteristics around how it works and that the people who are involved in that system, whether it's the person who's doing the trafficking, whether it's the person who's buying sex from a trafficking victim, or it's that person who's being exploited as a victim of trafficking, that all of those folks have predictable, if not necessarily rational, uh, motivations and actions that they're going to take. Um, I think one of the key pieces here is for us to look at the fact that this isn't um, detached from other social influences. So if you have a person who um, isn't able to get money to take care of their family, they might take a risk that puts them in one of those trafficking situations if they're defrauded or tricked that someone who is stable and has the money to take care of their family might not take. Similarly, if you have a person who doesn't feel like they can take care of their family through access to legal jobs, that same person might look to exploit another person um, in order to get that stability for their own family, especially if they've had experiences where they've been exploited or experienced violence themselves. And so when we go and pull the data out of who is involved in um, buying commercial sex from trafficking victims, exploiting people in commercial sex, or being exploited themselves, we end up seeing these fairly predictable trends around people who are um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color being exploited along lines of not just um, race and ethnic identity, but also along economic lines. And then we see disproportional exploitation by um, people who are higher economic classes and men um, who feel that they have more power and entitlement to access their needs from other people than um, women, non-binary people, and people coming from more marginalized communities. Those open up a whole set of doors into understanding why some people are buying sex from trafficking victims and some people aren't, why some people are um, trafficking or exploiting people in their community and why some people wouldn't do that, and why some people would be in a, a trafficking situation, whereas other people in their community with seemingly parallel 
situations aren't being exploited and aren't being trafficked. And those um, sort of details and distinctions between who's being trafficked and who isn't, I mean, sometimes you could say it's luck and so, or it's fate, um, but behavioral economics says that it's luck and fate that has math. You know, casinos certainly can figure out ways to make bets on how dice are going to roll. And we similarly um, can make bets around, okay, here's the, the things that we see as predictive of who's going to try to exploit another person. And if we say these are the predictive measures, what are the things that can flip a might exploit to a might not exploit? And once we figure out some of those underlying pieces, okay, we figured out an intervention that might um, do that uh, change, that might be able to create that difference between um, an exploiter and a person who doesn't exploit, how do we then scale that? Or how do we amplify or boost it? So it's not maybe um, we'll exploit to maybe not exploit, but let's go to maybe we'll exploit to definitely won't exploit, or maybe won't exploit and then to everyone. So we have a person that we think is going to definitely exploit and somehow we're able to get them to maybe not exploit. And if we can figure out those underlying pieces and then what the interventions or um, what would the other, I mean, I don't want to call it an experiment because it sort of goes beyond that, but what are the ways that we can test an effect, effective intervention? We can produce seemingly intractable social problems and the lesson I think that's really key is there are different places in the world that have different rates of sex trafficking. And that there's a reason why, like we can see that there are differences between those different communities. And so we can figure out what those differences are and how they interact with people on that individual level, and then try to recreate the positive situations where people are safer, where people are hurting each other less. Um, but we'll just do it in the, the American context um, and hopefully be able to to share that with people who are trying to stop exploitation all over the world. Awesome. So if I um, replay from a methodological perspective, what some of the key phases were, so people can understand this process of application of behavioral science, some of the, the key points would have been um, starting with a very different starting point about impacting and influencing behavior. Um, you, you talked about um, moving away from uh, just uh, outdated assumptions about what drives good behavior and bad behavior. You talked about challenging the assumptions of what makes a good person a good person or a bad person a bad person. And you said we, and, and the process of behavioral science brought a much more nuanced understanding of who our buyers are, which then brings us to um, a much more uh, fulsome conversation about what are the different enablers amongst these different buyer groups, which then in turn provides the opportunity to develop a new set of interventions to, to target them. And those interventions are also based on going beyond uh, some of the intuitive approaches that we might think about using and instead bringing the, the strategies and tactics from behavioral economics that include the nudge, but shoves and other approaches to impacting and influencing behavior that is much richer around understanding uh, personal identity, around understanding emotions, looking at uh, moral decision-making and how these factors and other factors weigh in differently at different times amongst uh, different buyers and then ultimately subjecting these programs to, to testing and impact evaluation to see if we're able to uh, curb uh, the buyers from, from engaging in that uh, behavior. And then, uh, so I think that's more or less that, you know, just, just recapping it, um, supplementing what you've said in terms of that, that uh, you know, the method that's behind uh, our, our work. 
And now uh, the other uh, portfolio or the other part of this value equation that you, that you also raised was uh, helping the victims. And that's another area of work that you've been devoted to. You want to talk more about that side? Sure. And, and I think in that area, the awareness of structural inequalities and structural barriers has really become a, a critical focal point of how Polaris is framing the issue of trafficking. So for a long time, there was a real um, sincere need on our part just to explain human trafficking and the term at all to people um, and just have people be able to like repeat back what, what we were saying when we said human trafficking or what, what they were seeing in the world that they could identify as human trafficking. But then people's sort of basic assumptions around why or how that was happening really left out for victims of trafficking, these structural barriers that were creating very um, predictable outcomes of certain groups of people being exploited, whether it was by their families or someone who was offering economic stability, someone who was offering um, safer housing or um, uh, uh, an intimate relationship that hadn't been available to them in the way that they had grown up, that there were these very clear um, risk factors for who traffickers would target that had impacts on, on people in different communities that, you know, I think in the, in the healthcare world, folks are just now coming to grips with the fact that, you know, like growing up and experiencing blackness in the United States has different health outcomes. Growing up and experiencing being um, Native American or indigenous in the United States has different health outcomes. And for us in the anti-trafficking space, we're saying, hey, if you grow up LGBTQ, if you grow up as a, you know, um, immigrant or first generation immigrant in this community, there are things that are acting upon you that are impacting you and putting you at risk that are not about personal choice, but certainly have personal outcomes and that they're about inequality and inequity. And other, other groups of people are kept safer if you have more wealth. Other groups of people are kept safer if you have a different skin color. And until the folks in the anti-trafficking movement um, are, are more clear and talking about that, again, the interventions that folks come up with are just not effective at keeping people safe. And the types of outreach and the supports that are offered to prevent trafficking, both upstream and um, re-victimization of people coming out of trafficking situations won't be sufficient and won't be accurately targeted. And so I think a lot of the understanding that we're using um, the, the behavioral science model to help us with really has to do with the, the predictable nature of being disempowered in an unequal power structure and what a reasonable response is to people targeting you for exploitation. And what are the ways that we can both change that system so that people aren't disempowered and that there is an inequality and um, adapt the supports that are available so that just because someone's in an unequal system doesn't mean they get exploited for sex or just because someone's trying to get out of a situation of exploitation doesn't mean that they're going to be re-victimized or doesn't mean um, that they're going to be um, criminalized or um, have to make a choice of, of living a, a lesser life, a less stable life, a less safe feeling life. And so, you know, in in both the exploiter space and um, the potential victim space, I think we're learning a lot looking at both of those micro factors about how people are working and why, and the macro factors of what are the systems that are producing those micro factors differently, depending on, you know, your skin color or, or where you're from or who you love or also or what language you speak all sorts of, of different things that really you know should be more uniform and and shouldn't put you more at risk of someone else exploiting you 
Well, so talking about uh, the project itself, could you share some of the things that stood out the most to you? What have been some of the highlights in this journey? So I'll say in terms of concepts, um, hot and cold state interventions, that's the thing that among the team at Polaris that was working on this, um, we became the, I don't know what, the, there's some sort of uh, psychological principle where once you hear about something, then you see it everywhere in the world. But all of us became like hot and cold state self analysts where we were seeing like, this was the thing I was thinking at this time. And then I was thinking a totally different thing at this other time about like what I wanted to eat or if I would exercise or, you know, what clothing I wanted to buy or, you know, in the age of COVID, like when I should or shouldn't wear a mask. It's very confusing to me. Um, and so I think that that understanding that people aren't uh, as individuals one thing, that at certain times we're functioning in one way and at other times we can be functioning at a, a, in another way and that um, interventions need to be tailored to where we think people are going to be at at the time that the intervention is being presented and that we can move people to the state that is more receptive to receive different types of interventions. And that, you know, again, has to do with um, potential victims of trafficking, the people who are buying sex from trafficking victims and traffickers, that these are all people who function in um, various modalities. And we've been adapting um, some of our uh, work already uh, based on um, that, um, that sort of shifting identity and shifting uh, functionality approach. I think one of the other things uh, that was important for us to examine was that there are limitations to interventions that will dictate who we want to be trying to influence and where we should put our energy and resources. Um, and so I think, you know, as I mentioned before, we have the people who are in the might exploit, you know, you might be a trafficker or you might be a person who buys traffic sex and getting them to a might not, that those might exploit people are very different from the definitely will exploit or, you know, like habitual, um, committed uh, people who are involved in an in action towards the people who are uh, sort of the, the new or first time um, buyers of traffic sex or the first time traffickers. And so trying to move those people who are not in the solidified camp in the habitual camp is going to save us so much energy and time and money. And the approach is going to be so different. Um, and similarly for the person who's in a situation of victimization or a situation of vulnerability versus the person who has been exploited for years and years and has the complex trauma that's developed and the survival strategies that have kept them safe and trying to somehow, you know, like push past those and connect with that person. It's going to take a totally different type of community offering and support um, offering to help that person feel like they can get out of a trafficking situation and, you know, sort of stemming the tide of how people are being exploited in the, the first place with the folks who, um, don't have that same type of um, armor built up can create tremendous opportunities for early intervention, tremendous opportunities for messaging to people who are in vulnerable situations. Um, and so I think that that sort of selective intervention and really deciding like, where are we gonna um, put our focus and where are we not um, for now? Because we always say like, we're not, but it's for now. Or where are we as, Polaris gonna put some of our interventions and then rely on other folks to intervene in the ways that we might not be best suited to intervene. That has been really impactful. And we have conversations about those types of things all the time, whether it's, okay, we have these um, sets of language resources, but we don't have these other sets of language resources. So do we intervene in the community that we can, or do we wait until we can intervene in, in many more communities? Um, do we intervene in the cities where we can connect with people or do we try to develop more of our network in, in rural and grassroots areas? And all of these decisions end up um, coming back to that idea about who we're gonna intervene with and how much um, we wanna change their behavior um, or how much we're hoping to connect with them. 
And so I think that that those types of principles have really been impactful on the way that we examine things, which um, you know becomes a project long past the project that you did for us, which was very specific. And we're just continuing to use the the same um, sort of outcomes and lessons learned and applying them to a number of other situations and decision making uh, opportunities that we have at Polaris. That's fantastic. I think that the uh, presentation on hot and cold states as a first principle and looking at how those context effects matter in cases, for instance, of individuals who are not necessarily, uh, you know, not necessarily buyers, it's more conditional as a function of what's happening in the moment really helps us to understand that our individual behaviors are so often shaped by seemingly you know um, superficial in the moment impulses and our strategies ought to make a good distinction between these context factors versus um, how a person is more sort of permanently wired. So if we're able to make that distinction, it allows us to be more effective. Um, it doesn't make us guilty of that fundamental attribution error that you know a bad person is always a bad person, but rather uh, some of the time, good people make very bad decisions. And so if we can stop them from making very bad decisions, it changes our approach to the tools and interventions that we'll use to make a difference. But if we take a much stronger approach that just defines people as bad people, needing the harshest of penalties and punishments, there's no room for the application of psychology and behavioral science and interventions to potentially mitigate and change this behavior from happening in the first place. Yeah, and I think one of the sort of eye-opening pieces of the experience was really being able to step into the world that for-profit companies have been in for so long in trying to better understand who we're serving and who the actors are that we're interacting with. So one of my colleagues at Polaris now can't get out of their head so much when they go into a grocery store because of work that we were trying to do on preventing trafficking and that they now see themselves as this person interacting in a contextual situation the same way that we were trying to understand other people. But it, it ends up being reciprocal because the more that we're examining ourselves in those different contexts and you know the times that we're our best selves and the times that we're our worst selves, the times that we're most motivated and least motivated, that interacts with all of these actors who are involved in trafficking as well. And so we just are striving now to have all of the, the types of um, you know, initiatives and projects that we're doing informed by that same approach that just as we are complex, multifaceted human beings, everyone that we're gonna be interacting with in a trafficking situation is a complex, multifaceted human being as well. And that is an opportunity, not so much of a challenge. Robert, I think that that brings us back to right where you started which was when you first started to learn about uh, heuristics and biases and the impact and influence that these have on the decisions that we make. Uh, and when you saw that it's not only about other people, but it's about our own decisions, you started to have the journey of what behavioral economics is, is all about um, un unfold in front of you. So I want to thank you very much for the project, the opportunity that we had to work together. And it was an honor for my team to serve your organization in the way that you have been serving so many victims. And it was an honor to be a part of that. I'd like to extend the opportunity for our listeners to serve the organization as well by looking at polarisproject.org and 
uh, finding out what the organization is up to and donating uh, if possible to the organization. And if anyone has been listening uh, to this call and they've either uh, been someone who um, I think is a, is a buyer and needs help potentially with addressing and curbing their behavior, um, or if someone has uh, been a victim or is a survivor and wants to reach out as a function of hearing uh, this podcast, we'd like to invite them to uh, the U.S. National Human Traffic Hotline. If they need to have that discussion, they can reach out to 1-888-373-7888. Robert, I'd like to turn it over to you for any final words. Thanks. I would just say it's been an exciting opportunity to get to dive into these issues with real professionals who um, are so energetic and informed and thorough around these issues, who bring so many um, insights as well, so many uh, nuances to the way that we can approach this work. Um, we've, of course, spawned 20 additional projects that we'd like to do that, to, to think about as well before we've even started um, testing out some of the, the first things that, that we're building. Um, but we really believe fundamentally that we can keep more people safe from human trafficking uh, through the, the partnership and collaboration with BE Works. So we just really have appreciated all of your support um, and all of the, the wisdom um, and experience and hopefully um, outcomes to come to share with everyone who's interested in them and then uh, more, more work to come to help keep people safe from trafficking. Thank you so much, Robert. Thanks.